Chapter Twenty One of Dash for Khartoum. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Dash for Khartoum by George Alfred Henty. Chapter Twenty One. Home. You are a nice fellow, aren't you, Edgar, to give us all this trouble? Rupert said as he held him at arm's length and gazed at him in the light of the fire that yusuf had lighted i see now that i made an awful ass of myself edgar said but i think you would have done the same if you had been in my place rupert and had heard what i heard i have no doubt i should rupert agreed it must have been an awful thing to hear still you must have seen by the advertisements that father did not believe the woman's story i did not see the advertisements edgar said i would not look at a paper because i thought he would advertise for me to come back and i felt i could not do so and it would have been harder to keep away if i had seen them you told me they were all well at home this was the first question he had asked after he had mounted rupert's camel quite well when i last heard i wrote and told them all about you then the sergeant was found and did not die he died the first day after we found him rupert said gravely he was insensible when we discovered him and i should have known nothing about him if they hadn't found two letters upon him one to me and one to father saying that his wife's story was a lie and that he could swear that neither of them could in any way identify either of us from the other he recovered consciousness before he died and signed in the presence of witnesses a deposition to the same effect so you saw me at corty edgar and would not make yourself known i would not have believed it of you well you see rupert i did not know at the time that the sergeant was who he was and still believed the woman's story to be true besides i had gone my own way and did not mean to see any of you again until i had got on and could do without assistance it seemed to me to be like asking for help and after all that i had had under false pretenses i would have rather died than do that but you see it wasn't under false pretenses edgar and you had as much right to consider yourself father's son as i had you must have known that from the sergeant afterwards yes i did learn that edgar allowed but i think that made me even more disinclined than before to show myself it would have looked as if i had come back only to put in a claim you are the most pig-headed fellow i ever saw edgar however i hope you have got out of all that feeling now quite rupert i am quite ready to go back with you and beg their pardon at home for all the trouble i have given them and to think that you have run all this awful risk to find me stuff and nonsense edgar when i found that you had been carried away as a slave as a matter of course i determined to get you out as soon as possible just as you would have done had i been caught by them but i could have done nothing if it hadn't been for this arab i am travelling with of course he will be well paid but still men are often tempted to be unfaithful however well they are paid and then he went on to tell edgar of the arrangement that had been made with the sheik edgar in return gave him a short sketch of his life since they had parted at cheltenham and told him of the promises he had made to el bakhat if he would take him down to one of the red sea ports i suppose they are discussing the matter together he said glancing at the two arabs who were deep in conversation on the other side of the fire well sheik what plan have you determined upon we both think that it will be impossible for us to travel north either to egypt or to berber and thence to suakim they will be on the watch for us everywhere our best plan will be to make for massawa well sheik you have heard that ben ibn has agreed to deliver us at one of the ports for a handsome reward he knows that englishmen's words can be relied upon and that there is no fear of his not getting the amount promised him my brother and i agree 
to give you an equal sum to that which he will receive there. He has not told me the sum, El Bakhat said. Tell him the terms, Ben Ibn, Rupert put in, not, of course, those you have already received for your expenses, but the sum that is to be paid you when you arrive at a port. The sheik repeated the terms to El Bakhat, who at once expressed himself as perfectly satisfied with them. The English are rich and generous, he said. El Bakhat will do his best to take them where they wish to go. Are you thinking of traveling with all this train? Rupert asked Ben Ibn. No, there is no occasion to do so. I have friends at a village on the Nile, and there my followers and their camels will remain, and El Bakhat's wife and child will remain with them also. We four will then travel on alone, taking with us Yusuf to cook for us and look after the camels. We shall separate from the others at once, as it will be much safer to travel in two small parties. There will be no fear as to their safety, as they will take my regular permit to trade, and no one will connect them in any way with El Bakhat. You and your brother will ride the Hiris. I have a half-bred camel that will carry me well, although it will not compare in speed with yours. El Bakhat's camel is also a good one. If we are pursued, we have agreed that our best plan will be to turn off and find a hiding place, and for you to push on alone. On those camels you may defy pursuit. If pushed, they will travel a hundred and fifty miles a day. When you get to Massawa, you will wait until we join you there. We are content to trust to your word. Still, we hope that we may keep together, for although your brother now speaks Arabic so well, that he could pass as a native in casual conversation, it is better that we should be together, in which case it will be we who will do the talking. Have you two Heries? Edgar asked Rupert. They are not quite full-bred. It is very rare to meet with them, and the price is extremely high, but these are nearly full-bred, and can swing along as fast as a horse can trot, and keep it up for twelve hours at a stretch." The march was resumed at midnight. The two sheiks rode ahead, Edgar and Rupert followed on the Heries, while Yusuf was mounted on one of the spare camels, and rode with the other Arab in the rear. The two brothers talked by turns, and both were surprised when the first streak of daylight appeared. The party now separated, the sheik's wife and child taking their seats on one of the camels. She took a warm farewell of Edgar. Amina will never forget the young white man who has lived in her tents, she said. He is brave in war and is a wise counselor. He will be a great man among his own people. And I shall never forget you, Edgar replied, and your kindness to the white slave. When the sheik returns from Massawa, he will bring with him tokens of my remembrance. As soon as the party had separated, the sheiks put their camels to their best speed. Yusuf had been taken up by Edgar and rode behind him, the Hyries carrying the double weight with ease. At sunset they halted. We are now, El Bakhat said to Edgar, beyond the reach of pursuit. We may be stopped and arrested by others, but those from El Obed will never see the tails of our camels. I wish, Edgar said, as they were riding along the next morning, that you would get rid of that wig and your dye for five minutes, Rupert, so that I could see what you really look like. You are such an awful object with that bush of hair that I do not seem to recognize you at all. It is different with me. I am only brown, while you are a sort of dirty black, and when this cloth round my head is off, you really see me as I am." We should not have known each other by our figures. It is nearly three years since you left Cheltenham, and of course we have both widened out a lot since then. You have widened more than I have, but I have grown most. Yes, you are quite two inches taller than I am, Rupert. What are you, six feet? About half an inch under. Ah, then you are just the two inches taller. I am forty, chest measurement. I am not more than thirty-seven, Edgar. Ah, I expect you will be forty before you have done, Rupert. You see, neither of us is anything like his full width yet. I have had harder work than you have. Ah, Edgar, 
if we could both play in the house team now it would make a difference wouldn't it you remember how skinner was always lamenting our want of weight i don't think edgar said with a laugh that he has gained much in weight he was about our size before but he looked to me quite a little chap when i saw him on the march he is tough rupert said he is like whipcord all over he is a capital fellow not a bit changed easton has turned out first rate he was awfully good to me after you went away and took no end of pains to cheer me up had me down to his place in the holidays and was a real friend he is a big fellow now and in another two or three years will make a splendid man they will be delighted when we both turn up again i don't think either of them thought when they said good-bye to me that i should ever get back they thought the language would floor me i think you have got on wonderfully that way i thought i had picked it up pretty quickly but you jaw away as if you had been years at it i have been more with them rupert besides i had picked up a little in the year i was at cairo you see i had nearly four months start of you and in the life i led among them of course i had a lot more occasion to talk than you have had always on camelback and only talking in the encampment at night el bakhat says that in a casual conversation now no one would notice that i was not a native so if we do get into any mess and have to ride for it by ourselves we shall have no difficulty in making our way across the country but i do not see much chance of that if we should fall in with the modest your sheik can give his name and appear to be the head of the party and as there is nothing against him i don't see why we should have any trouble i dare say we shall fall in with some modest rupert said i got up the maps thoroughly before i started and specially studied the routes leading to the coast i fancy the line we shall travel will take us down by kasala the modest were besieging it but i don't know whether it has fallen or not the safest route would certainly be to go through abyssinia but the arabs wouldn't like to travel that way if they could help it there have been troubles for years between abyssinia and the sudan and it is by no means certain what sort of treatment we should meet if we got there massawa is certainly the best place to strike for suakum would have been the best place in some respects because there are lots of english there and we should have no difficulty in getting money to pay the sheiks but after all it is only a question of a week or two's delay at the most i have letters from my father authorizing me to draw upon him for any amount and if we cannot get it at massawa we shall only have to send up to the officer in command at suakim he would cash a draft out of the pay-chest or if he could not do it that way would get some merchant there to do it they no longer hurried but made moderate marches stopping only at small villages there was no difficulty in obtaining food and shelter as rupert's conductor had brought on with him a sufficient store of merchandise to pay their way down to the coast on these occasions edgar and rupert kept in the background looking after the camels while yusuf waited upon the sheiks and afterwards cooked a meal for the two englishmen he did most of the talking with the poorer villagers gossiped with them about the state of the country the chance of peace being re-established and retailed all sorts of wonderful stories of the doings of the Mahdists. both branches of the nile were crossed in their journey but no incident of any kind occurred until they had passed the eastern arm they were now getting into a more dangerous country bodies of the Mahdi's troops going to and from kasala which had they learned at last surrendered were encountered and questions were asked as to where they were going and what was the object of their journey upon these occasions ben ibn acted as spokesman and represented that they had friends among the hadendoa tribesmen and wished to learn whether any trade could be opened with the coast when within a day's march of kasala they met a number of camels laden with spoil from that town on their way to khartoum accompanied by a number of foot soldiers and ten or twelve horsemen riding twenty or thirty yards behind the sheiks edgar saw one of the horsemen look earnestly at el bakhat and then spur forward to speak to the others who were a short distance ahead 
"'That fellow has recognized El Bakhat,' he exclaimed. "'Ride on, Rupert!' They both shook the halters, and the hieries broke into a trot. "'Ride, sheiks!' Edgar exclaimed, as he came up to the others. "'One of the horsemen has recognized El Bakhat. A minute or two later they heard a shout behind them, but paid no attention. "'We have got four or five hundred yards start,' Rupert said, looking back. "'But the horsemen will overtake us. They can go faster than the camels for a burst. "'Ride, sheik,' he said. "'Push on to the utmost. If we can get a mile away from the footmen, before they come up to us, we can thrash the horsemen.' The start they had obtained, while the man who had recognized Elbeck Hat was explaining to the others who he was, and how much his capture was desired at Khartoum, was invaluable to the fugitives, and the horsemen started in a body, shouting and yelling and firing their guns. The bullets whistled harmlessly round the fugitives. "'Make for that clump of trees on rising ground,' Edgar said. "'Then spring off the camels and fight them on foot.' what arms have you rupert i have two revolvers besides this rifle you take one of them we shall beat them off easily enough they are only about two to one when they reached the trees they were but a hundred yards ahead and less than a mile from the caravan which had halted when the horsemen commenced the pursuit they leapt from their camels do you hold their bridles yusef edgar said we will beat them off and steadying his rifle against the trunk of a tree he fired at the nearest horseman who fell instantly from the saddle rupert's rifle cracked a moment later and the two sheiks added their fire had the horsemen been coming up in a close body they would have gained the wood for the leader was but fifty yards away when edgar fired but they were scattered and the leaders being shot down the others wheeled their horses and galloped back towards the caravan at full speed now we will be off again rupert said and in a minute they had mounted and continued their flight there is no fear of the footmen overtaking us ben ibn remarked our camels are not like yours but they can trot at a good pace for forty miles it is fortunate we had them for they would soon have been up to them had we only had common camels of course we must strike off straight for massawa now the danger is not over some of the horsemen will bear the news to kassala and a troop will be sent out in pursuit of us it is well that we have journeyed quietly and that the beasts are in good condition hour after hour passed the camels kept on with unswerving gait until long after nightfall my beast smells water ben ibn said as his camel after waving his head backwards and forwards suddenly quickened its pace another quarter of an hour they stopped at a small pool in what during the rainy season was the bed of a river and here they halted the camels having drunk their fill were given an ample allowance of corn from the saddle-bags and were then picketed close at hand while yusuf prepared a meal for their masters what is the country like that we have to traverse edgar asked by to-morrow night ben ibn said we shall have reached the mountains we are on very high land now, and have a great descent to make to reach the coast. We must inquire the way to the pass, by which the road from Kassala descends to Massawa. If we strike it without failure, we shall be safe, but if we miss our way, and the horsemen from Kassala get there first, we shall be in a bad position. They will have heard of our arms and strength, and are sure to have too strong a force for us to attack if we fail to find the road at once our best plan would be to turn and travel north until we reach a road going down to suakim would that one of us had travelled here before el bakhat said if we could but have continued our journey to-night we should be safe upon the desert one can travel by the stars but the ground is getting far too broken to cross at night we should only weary our camels in vain how far is it to the gorge you speak of el bakhat i know not for certain those who travel the road have told me that it is three or four days journey with laden camels from kassala our camels can easily do three days march in one and if we have the good fortune to strike the road near the mouth of the pass we may pass through it before dark to-morrow but by that time 
they may be there from Kasala. Well, I suppose we must take our chances, Rupert said. He and Edgar soon lay down and were fast asleep, but the two Arabs talked together for a long time before they followed their example. At daybreak the party were on their feet. We talked it over last night, Ben Ibn said, and we both think that it were best not to proceed. The horsemen would have reached the town with the news three hours after noon, and had they sent off at once horsemen and fast camelmen down the road to Massawa, we think that they would be at the pass before we could possibly reach it. Had we known the country and could have travelled all night, we should have been there long before them. As it is, the risk would be too great. We are already some distance north of the Massawa road, and it will not be so many days longer a journey to Suakim than to Massawa. Osman Digma is lying at Handaub and Temei, so we cannot come down by the Berber road. But there are passes by which we can descend to the low country near Tokar. Once down there, we can cross from the foot of the hills to the sea by night, and then follow the coast until we arrive at Suakim. I think that is the best plan, Sheik, Edgar said. A few days will make no difference, and it would be as well to avoid all risks. Accordingly, on mounting, the camel's heads were turned to the northeast. Yusuf rode behind Rupert and Edgar by turns, so as to divide the labor between the two heiries. A few villages were passed, but the inhabitants fled into their houses or into the fields on seeing the approach of the party, the arrival of strangers meaning extortion and demands for tribute. So they journeyed for several days, until one afternoon they came to a large village which was evidently inhabited. They alighted and knocked at the door of the principal house. No answer was at first returned, but on el Bakhat shouting that he would break down the door if it was not opened, bolts were heard to unfasten. The door opened, and an old man presented himself. "'Why did you not reply to our knocking?' el Bakhat asked angrily. "'Is this your hospitality to strangers?' "'My lord must pardon me,' he said submissively, "'but it was but last week that a party of the Mahdi's soldiers came along here and stripped the village of all it possessed, and drove off its bullocks and sheep. Save our grain, we have not that we can call our own. We do not belong to the Mahdi, Ben Ibn said, but are peaceful travellers. We desire only to fill our bags with grain for the animals, for which we will pay you the full value. For ourselves we need nothing, although if you have, peradventure, a kid or a sheep left among you, we will gladly purchase it. Enter, my lord, the old man replied briskly, evidently much relieved at the announcement. All that the village still possesses is at your service. He gave an order, and a boy brought out a basket of grain, which he emptied before the camels, while the two Arabs, Edgar and Rupert, entered the house. Ten minutes later, a villager brought in a freshly killed kid, which Yusuf, after lighting a fire in the courtyard, proceeded to cut up and cook. In the meantime, the Arabs had entered into a conversation with the peasant as to the routes down to the sea. They learned that so far they had been coming in the right direction, and that some thirty miles farther they would come upon a track leading down to Tokar. You must look well for it, he said. It is never greatly traversed, and since the troubles, all trade has ceased, and you may well cross the track without noticing it. Have you any in the village who know the track? Edgar asked. There are several here who have been down to Tokar, my lord. We will give ten yards of good cloth to one who will go and set us on the road. We will take him behind one of our camels, and as we shall start at daybreak, he can be back here before nightfall. I suppose when we once find the track, it will not be difficult to follow it. I can doubtless find a guide, the peasant said. He can give you instructions as to the path, or he could go with you, if you choose, still further, to show you the way. I will go and find you such a man. An active-looking young native presently arrived, and said that he was willing to be their guide to the point where the track left the highlands and entered the gorges leading down towards the sea. 
it was he said four days camel march beyond the point where they would strike the track and he would accompany them this distance for forty yards of cotton cloth the bargain was struck at once and the following morning they started the guide riding behind edgar as there was no occasion for haste and the camels might be required to exert their utmost speed when they reached the low country the journey was performed by three easy stages the distances being about forty miles each day it was well that they had a guide with them for the track was in most places entirely obliterated you cannot miss your way now the natives said at their last halting place by some shallow wells this depression leads straight down to the pass it is two days march hence to the lower plains when the valley at last opens on them you will be about ten miles west of tokar the next morning the guide started on his return journey the cloth had been given to him before starting and he now carried a few pounds of grain and a small bag of dried dates for his five days journey back to his village the journey down the gorges was an arduous one the path had been swept away by the last season's rains and in some places where the valley narrowed to a gorge but a few yards wide with the rocks rising sheer up hundreds of feet on either side the bottom was filled with large blocks of stone brought down by the floods whose highest level could be seen forty or fifty feet above them on the rocks occasionally it was necessary to build a sloping platform with small boulders of stones to enable the camels to get over the vast blocks that filled the space between the walls it took them three days of arduous labor but the valley at last opened out and they saw a broad expanse of country stretching before them no one had either met or passed them on the way down but here in the lower valley there were several flocks of sheep and goats watched over by arab boys these at the sight of strangers hastily collected their animals and drove them up the hillside but at a shout from ben ibn saying that they were friends and would do them no harm two of them presently came down on hearing that the travellers intended to camp for the night they led the way to the wells and for three yards of cotton killed and brought in a sheep presently the rest of the lads came down and squatted near the fire that yusuf had kindled and after the party had dined were rejoiced by the present of some wheaten cakes and a portion of the cooked meat they now became very communicative they belonged to the haddon doa tribe there were three or four hundred of the dervishes at tokar osman digma had in all four or five thousand men at handau and was soon going to drive the kaffirs into the sea many of their tribe were with him but others were disheartened at the long delay to carry his promise into effect they had lost too a great many of their best fighting men in the battles with the kaffirs but no doubt when osman digma announced that the favorable time had arrived all would again join him in order to have their share of the plunder of suakim the next day they stopped at the wells telling the boys that the camels were sorely wearied by their journey down the gorge and that they needed a day's rest in the evening as soon as the meal was over they mounted their camels much to the surprise of the native boys and started edgar could judge of the general position for though he had not been as far as tokar he could tell pretty well the line they should take to come down upon trinkitat as soon as they were fairly out of the valley the camels were put to their full speed and in four hours the shining sea in the bright moonlight lay before them crossing a shallow lagoon they were upon the sandy beach the pace of the camels was now slackened as it was useless to arrive at suakim before daybreak as they would have been liable to be shot by the sentries in the forts if they approached in the darkness when day broke edgar and rupert gave a shout of joy for three or four miles away could be seen the masts of shipping again the camels broke into a trot and in half an hour they approached the forts raised to defend the town on the land side from the attacks by osman digma's followers no questions were asked them for natives belonging to friendly tribes frequently entered or left the town 
as they crossed the ground between the forts and the town they saw a party of marines marching out to relieve those who had occupied the fort at night they reined in their camels and rupert addressed the officer marching at the head of the party can you tell me sir if lieutenant skinner is at suakim at present the officer was astounded at being thus addressed in pure english by a wild-looking native and the men following him were no less astonished is it possible the officer exclaimed that you are mr clinton that is my name rupert replied the officer advanced and grasped his hand warmly i am glad indeed to see you he said skinner is my subaltern and has often spoken to me of what he considered your hopeless journey to try to find your brother and said that if you did get through it alive you were as likely as not to turn up here i congratulate you indeed have you been successful and he looked doubtfully at rupert's companions yes thank god i have succeeded this is my brother edgar the officer shook hands warmly with edgar and even the men who had heard what was said raised a shout of welcome i forgot skinner is in the rear the officer said and raising his voice shouted his name skinner came running up he had been wondering what the halt was for edgar and rupert had dismounted by this time and ran forward to meet him he stopped in surprise and then recognized rupert whom he had already seen in his present disguise clinton he exclaimed with a joyous shout is it really you thank god you have gotten back again and 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 this is edgar rupert put in for a minute or two the three stood shaking each other's hands too excited and joyous to speak while the soldiers cheered lustily the captain in command came up look here skinner it would be too bad to take you away from your friends now so i will take it upon myself to give you leave off duty i will get thompson to stay out until tomorrow morning in your place he won't mind when i tell him why and you can take his turn on duty on shore next time talking excitedly together they entered the town the arabs following on their camels and yusuf leading the two heiries the first thing to do skinner said is to get you rigged out decently i suppose it will be some time before you can get rid of your dye but at any rate you can get dressed like christians and you can get rid of that fearful wig rupert i will send off a boat to my ship with a note and they will soon send you on shore a couple of suits of clothes mine would be of no use you could not get into them this is the only hotel in the place first of all we must see about these arabs being made comfortable where can they put up their camels oh that will be all right skinner said one of the fellows here will take them under his charge skinner entered and came out with a servant you can put your camels in the courtyard here el bakhat edgar said after speaking to the men yusuf will look after them you had better find a lodging for yourselves you will be more at home there than you would here get everything you want you will have no difficulty in finding everything in the arab quarter skinner lend me a sovereign will you we have been living on barter for a long time but they will want money here this is worth five dollars he said as he handed the money to el bakhat but ah i forgot ben ibn knows about the value of english money if you will come here at noon i may be able to tell you something about the money they then entered the hotel with skinner get breakfast the best you can get skinner ordered and show me to a room where there is plenty of water and towels these are englishmen though you would not think so from their appearance the young fellows enjoyed a thorough wash and rupert got rid of his wig but they had to attire themselves in their former garments for breakfast after existing for months upon native fare the breakfast was a luxury indeed by the time they had finished the messenger skinner sent off returned with two suits of clothes sent ashore by the officers of his ship and having attired themselves in these they went with skinner to the political officer when he understood who they were he received them with much warmth i have had letters from captain clinton he said respecting you 
saying that it was possible that you might turn up here, and requesting me to assist you in getting any bills you might draw on him cashed. I will go with you to the principal merchant here. No doubt he will do it, but if not, I can manage the affair with one of the ship's paymasters. The merchant, however, was perfectly willing to honor their draft upon their father for a thousand pounds upon the statement of the officer that he would himself guarantee its payment, and he told them that his servants should bring the money in silver to the hotel. Four hundred pounds was the amount that Ben Ibn had been promised on delivering Rupert in safety at one of the ports, and an equal sum was to be given to El Bakhat. This left them two hundred pounds for getting to England, for Edgar had learned that his regiment had a month previously sailed for India, and he considered that under the circumstances he was perfectly justified in reporting himself at the depot at home. The sheiks on their arrival at the hotel received with great satisfaction the bags of money containing the stipulated amount. To these were added a brace of revolvers each, being the two Rupert had carried and two they had purchased in Suakim, together with ten boxes of ammunition. Edgar also gave to El Bakhat a set of jewelry and several silk scarves for Amina. Now, Sheik, he said, I should like to purchase the freedom of Yusuf. What do you value him at? I will give him to you, the Sheik said. You have treated me well and honorably. No, I will not have that, Sheik. He is your property and is a very useful slave. I will give you two hundred dollars for him. It is well, El Bakhat said. He is yours. Now, Rupert said, there are the two hieries. They are yours by right, Ben Ibn, but I would fain give one to El Bakhat. I will give you three hundred dollars to forego your claim to it. I know the beast is worth more, but if you possess one of them, it will suffice for your needs and you will oblige me if you will part with the other. I can refuse my lord nothing, Ben Ibn said, and the possession of two such hieries might well draw envy and enmity upon me. I will accept his offer. Then the other hierie is yours, El Bakhat, Rupert said, as a special present from me for the kindness you have shown my brother. What do you both mean to do now? We have agreed to journey up the coast together, and then to travel across the mountains to Asawan, and there buy camels and goods, or we may buy them here if we see bargains to suit us. Then we shall turn south. I shall go on alone to Khartoum. I know many of the Mahdi's officers, and shall buy presents to them, obtain a pardon for El Bakhat, and permission for him to return to his tribe. Money will do as much among the Mahdi's people as elsewhere." We shall see you again tomorrow, sheiks. A steamer sails in the afternoon for Suez, and we shall go in her. Come here to say good-bye to us in the morning. When the sheiks had left, Yusuf was called in, and Edgar told him that he had purchased his freedom from El Bakhat. The negro threw himself on his knees in an ecstasy of delight and poured out his thanks. Now what would you like to do, Yusuf? Edgar went on when the negro had quieted down. I can recommend you here to some merchant as a faithful man whom he can trust, or if you would like to set up a shop here, I will give you two hundred dollars with which to trade, or I can take you up with us to Suez and give you strong letters of recommendation with which you can obtain employment there. No, my lord, Yusuf cried, none of these things. I would go with you." and be your servant. I will never leave you. But I don't want a servant, Yusuf, Edgar said. As I have told you, I am a soldier, and soldiers do not have servants. Oh, that is nonsense, Rupert put in. You are not going on as a private soldier. You know you need not reckon upon that, Edgar. You like the fellow, and there is no doubt he would make you a faithful servant, and anyhow they could find something to do for him at home." Edgar pointed out to Yusuf that the life would be strange to him, the climate altogether different to that to which he was accustomed, and that he would find no one who could speak his language. But Yusuf was unmoved, and entreated so earnestly to be taken that Edgar gave in, saying that, after all, if he repented afterwards, 
he could be sent back to egypt just as this was settled a messenger entered with a telegram from captain clinton in answer to that they had dispatched before they had sat down to breakfast announcing their safe arrival it contained simply the words thank god come home at once they went off to dinner with skinner on board ship and the story of their adventures excited immense interest among the officers skinner returned with them on shore and remained with them until the steamer left in the afternoon yusuf who had been rigged out in white trousers and jacket a checked shirt and straw hat accompanied them the two sheiks saw them off and stood looking after them with grave regret until the steamer was far from land at suez edgar and rupert provided themselves with a stock of linen and clothing two days later they took passage to brindisi in a p and o steamer and travelled rapidly across europe their colour excited much surprise among the passengers on board the steamer but as they had no wish to keep on telling their story they kept themselves apart and made no acquaintances during the short voyage yusuf was astounded at everything he saw the ship and her machinery the trains the fertile country through which they travelled the frequent villages and great towns there was no stay in london they drove across from charing cross to paddington and went down by the first train a telegram had been dispatched from dover and a carriage was at the station to meet them and the servant handed rupert a note it contained a few words from his father saying that he had not come to meet them as he thought it better that they should all meet together at home it was edgar who received the first greeting from father mother and sister while rupert stood by well content that his brother should on this occasion come first it was little over a year since he had said good-bye to them while it was more than three since edgar had seen them and his own greeting though delayed for a moment was no less warm than that of edgar father and mother edgar began as soon as they turned again from rupert i want to say that i feel how wrong i was then don't say it captain clinton broke in we won't talk about that time at all you suffered and we have all suffered but good has come out of it thank god the matter is settled now forever and we know there is nothing more to be found out about it and that there is no fear of our ever having to look at one or other of you in a different light to that which we regard you as our two sons of both of whom we have every reason to be proud there now let us talk of other things you have both gone through wonderful adventures which we are burning to hear about you have changed a great deal edgar mrs clinton said of course we have seen rupert comparatively lately but i think that you have changed more than he has from what you both were three years ago you look older than he does and your figure is more set he has gone through so much more rupert said he has been doing man's work for three years i have only had a year and a half of it you need not be in a hurry to look old rupert captain clinton laughed that will come soon enough and you have widened out a good deal in this last year you had got very weedy and i am glad to see that you are filling up i have some news for you edgar i saw lord wolseley on his return to england and he spoke very kindly of you both and when i got your telegram from suakim i wrote to him again and received a very warm letter of congratulation from him in reply he told me that he had received a most favourable report of you from your colonel who said that your conduct has been most exemplary since you had entered the regiment and that as you had been recommended for the victoria cross he had intended to recommend you for a commission as soon as you had served a qualifying time as a sergeant but lord wolseley said that he thought it would be a great pity for you to lose four or five years seniority by waiting to get your commission from the ranks and that he had that morning spoken to the duke of cambridge about you and that the latter had put your name down for a queen's cadetship so that if you could pass the mere qualifying examination you could have a commission at once 
there will be an examination in two months time and if you go up to a crammer and work hard you will be able to brush up your schoolwork and get through if not of course you can go in again six months later i am afraid you will hardly get ready in time for the first i don't know father rupert said while edgar expressed his lively satisfaction edgar speaks arabic like a native and if he takes that up as a subject he is sure to get full marks for it and that will help him tremendously of course he would have no chance of getting through if he had to go in for the competition but something like half the number of marks are enough for the qualifying examination well we mustn't be too sanguine captain clinton said and eight months quiet study won't hurt him after campaigning in egypt for two years by the way edgar i paid in the money for you to buy out and sent in an application in your name these things take some little time before they are carried out but no doubt we shall hear soon but in the meantime you had better write at once to the officer commanding your depot saying that you have returned home and asking for a month's leave of absence you are sure to get your discharge before that is over edgar remained at home for a week spending much of his time however over his old school books then he went up to town and worked at a crammer's until the examination came off when thanks in no small degree to the number of marks he obtained for his arabic he just managed to get the number necessary to qualify him to his great satisfaction he was at once gazetted to a regiment as if he had been promoted from the ranks instead of having to go through the course at sandhurst and thus gained several months seniority three months leave was granted him and at the end of that time he joined his regiment which was stationed at malta no question as to which of the clintons is the legitimate son of the captain and his wife has ever again troubled them edgar and rupert know that they are equally dear to those at home and all are happy in the knowledge that nothing henceforth can break the closeness of their tie and that it can never be known which is the lawful heir of the estates what is much more important to them both neither of them can say which has the first claim on the love and affection of captain and mrs clinton and of their sister end of chapter twenty one end of dash for khartoum by george alfred henty